My friends, what lays before you is the myriad knowledge of an unfathomable universe. Join our intrepid remembrancers as they explore the heresy as history. From deep within the farthest reaches of the great library of Tiska, we are the Heresy Grad School. So said the War Master in his wisdom. Go forth, my sons, and illuminate them. Hello and welcome to Heresy Grad School, where we cover the heresy's history. And we do the research so you don't have to. In this episode, we're going to be covering the Battle of Trisolian. Love that. Okay. <laughs> That's a fantastic transition. If listeners are hearing that, it's pretty awesome. Okay, so I know we all have our favorites, but this episode features one of my favorite legions, the Sons of Horus. First legion I ever painted and printed some too, but that's a whole nother story. So this episode features Restless Primark Syndrome, <laughs> a daring raid on Horus's flagship, and a whole host of familiar faces. So, Jason, this is not like exactly new lore like we covered last time in the Exandria 4 incident. But it's rather a look at some extant lore. I think you, we were just talking about from the Wolf King. Is that correct? Right. This isn't the same sort of like completely new thing. This is more of like a fleshing out of some of the events we've already heard between the Black Library books and the Horus Heresy books themselves. This is going to be prior to the Siege of Terra itself, but towards the later part of the Heresy. Circa, yeah, around a little after Wolf King and kind of fleshes out some of the events in a narrative style of uh, Guy Haley's Wolfsbane of the uh, Space Wolf assault on some of the Sons of Horus flagships. That's right. Awesome. Well, so this is not exactly new lore. And so it's awesome. And let's get into what else is going on. So it's featuring an epic clash between the 16th, so the Sons of Horus, and the 6th Legion, so the Wolves of Fenris, the sun, the uh, Sons of Russ, if you would. <laughs> There's a whole host of familiar Nobody faces. calls them that, Pat. Nobody calls them the Sons of Russ. No, they're the, they're the Velka Fenrika, or they're the, they're the Space Wolves. Whatever. <laughs> do, do not make our listeners doubt us. Could yeah, even go with know. the route if you wanted to. Oh, perfect. The route. Space pups, what have you. <laughs> um, anyways, I have no respect for Space Wolf players, except for Ben, of course, and Austin. But that's a whole nother story. So we've got a whole host of familiar faces. Keen listeners and readers may have recognized Gager Fellhand from The Burning of Prospero. I'm well aware I butchered his name. But also some new ones. We've got Honor Hellcrass. So he's the captain of the 68th company. The custodian of the vaults seems to be a lot kind of going around. And he's the Legion's master of legacy, which is a cool title, which Dave, Jason and I kind of spitballed a little bit around. Like, what does the Legion's master of legacy actually mean? I think in this case, Dave, is he just the docent to like the Sons of Horus, like, flagship of or hall of memories like what's going on here yeah like, like no disrespect to on her huckross or heckrass but i i did get the very distinct vibe that this guy had been sort of like retired out of active line duty and given this sort of honorary position of like caring for the war trophies or the museum on board the vengeful spirit so it was like you know, it's like his job to sort of protect, you know, the history of, of the 16th Legion as they had gone through the Great Crusade and conquered all these amazing and now extinct species. <laughs> so, yeah, it's uh, I don't know. That's the vibe I got. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, as a Sons of Horus player, I, I certainly hope he's not the guy taking tickets at the museum or anything like that. But, 
you know, here's the head of the false emperor. Here's a standard from a company that no longer exists, that kind of guy. But yeah. he is also a chieftain, so we know that much. No, he's 100% the guy given the new Astartes, the field trip through the <laughs> vengeful spirit. They're like, okay, young sons of Horus, young Chthonians, this is where it all started. This is how it began. And this is who we killed. And then we went over here and we killed some more people. And then we went over here and we killed more people and aliens. And now your field trip is over. More or less. Yeah. yeah. So I know something that's definitely going to pique your interest, Dave, is like, I'm going to mispronounce this as I normally do, because I'm the normal here. You and Jason are, are the real professors. But there's a mention of a xenocide? Like... That definitely has got to pique your interest, right? I mean... Oh, yeah. A anytime there's a mention of a xenocide, I, I get excited. So here we have just kind of an offhand comment from the Black Library team or Forge World team, and it's called the Carthid Xenocide. So, I mean, we had the Rangden Xenocide, which was everything to the First Legion. Really, Rangda was everything to the emperor and most of the great crusade because had they lost against the Rangda, very likely the crusade would have kind of stalled out and humanity may never have gotten to the edge of the galaxy. So here we have a species that we've never heard of or a race we've never heard of, the Carthid. It's kind of a throwaway line, but we know from many, many white dwarf articles in the early 80s and 90s that what may be a throwaway line somewhere ends up becoming a novel or several or launching the next kind of meta plot line down the road. So yeah, I think the Carthage Xenocide might be something to look out for in the future. Could be very cool. Yeah. I mean, it is kind of like going backwards in time, which I know they're currently trying to like, I hate to say it, wrap up the heresy but it'd be great if they fleshed out more of like, let's flesh out Ulanor a little bit. Let's flesh out this a little bit. You know, things that are touched on in the Black Book and the actual like Black Library books and things like that, that they could totally go back and not necessarily clear up, but provide a better picture around. So looking to, forward to that. But anyways, back over to this, back over to Trisolian. So let's talk about when are we? So it's the early parts of 12M31. So... That gives us some time reference. And so where are we? We're at Trisolian, so it's a Mechanicum Forge world. And as usual, Games Workshop does it again and throws something into the Segmentum Obscurus. Listeners, if you know, and if you've listened to any of our series, the Segmentum Obscurus feels just like the catch-all of areas or of stories, of places, of planets, what have you. I mean, and that's fine. I just wish we had a better star map. And I'm sure Dave does too, collector of the maps. So Jason, why don't you take it away and start breaking down the story? Sure. So as we mentioned early on, this is sort of a little bit after the Alaxis Nebula, which would be the engagement mainly between the Space Wolves and the Alpha Legion, but also a little bit of Dark Angels action thrown in there just for spice. Russ has made his way back home. He's doesn't have a whole lot of a legion left. Space Wolves were always kind of on the smaller end of legions for mysterious hinted at reasons, but, uh, you know, a little bit smaller, a lot of combat casualties, maybe. So this is him rounding up the remnants of the legion he has left. Uh, Wolfsbane does a really good job of kind of elaborating on just how beaten to crap the sixth is at this point. But their plan here, Russ is a wolfman of action. He's not just going to sit around hanging out in the orbit of Terra and wait for Horus to come to him. And it's a little weird to kind of agree with Lehman Russ over something, but compared to Dorn's plan to just sit on Terra and make it as big an armored tin can as possible, I kind of understand where Russ is coming from. Uh, I mean, he's being pragmatic, right? I mean, yeah, unlike exactly. If you'd let Horus sit and stew, he's going to come up with a plan. Right. You know? And if Horus knows exactly where you are and has literally the entirety of the galaxy to gather resources from, it can cause a little bit of a problem, especially considering by this point, Dorn has already lost access to most of the resources of the Mechanicum. And small Mechanicum, well, comparatively to Mars, uh, small Mechanicum forges like this one 
in the Trisolian system, managed by Hester Aspertia Sigma Sigma. They're the little holdout renegade forge worlds that have kind of refused to fall under the sway of the real fabricator general, Kelbor Hall. And that's great for them. They've also come under siege by this pretty large Sun's Forest fleet, causing a lot of problems. So Russ's idea here is to not just sit around and wait for Horus, but to go after them first to provoke an incautious and overconfident response, which, I mean, if there are many legions known for that, you know, overconfidence is definitely something the Sons of Horus and the Space Wolves are guilty of on multiple occasions. But uh, yeah, so either a, a sort of spear thrust to the throat plan and also provoking them into overconfident action Dave, what do you think of this plan of uh, Lehman Russ's to kind of spite Horace into doing something stupid? I think Lehman Russ is basically a Primarch who can't sit still and really doesn't like being told what to do, especially not by his big brother, Rogel Dorn, who I guess timeline-wise might be his little brother. I'm not exactly sure. But definitely Lehman Russ is not going to sit on Terra and wait for the forces of... Horus and the Traitor Rebellion to come to the doorsteps of Terra and the Soul System, even though he's told repeatedly and explicitly not to leave by not only Rogel, but Sanguinius and the Khan. And even I think Malkador tries to talk him out of it. But Lehman Ross is not one to be dissuaded from his plans of action, as you rightly put. He's a man of action. So I think he decides the best bet is to take what remnants are left of his legion and see if he can do sort of a, I guess, a spearhead strike. And it ends up actually in the lore, you know, sort of playing out for him, I think, if you read the subtext. But yeah, my opinion is this is Russ being true to his nature. He was never going to sit on Terra, and he was never going to hold the walls with the rest of his loyal brother Primarchs. I do think it's interesting, though, like, of all of the Primarchs, I mean, it makes sense that he's running into things. And again, I know we're going to a little bit of a rabbit hole around this, but like, shit, even the con stayed. Like, dude's itching to hop on a jet bike and take some skulls, but at least he realized the necessity of defending Terra. But I think there's a little bit of hubris to at play here, maybe more than a little bit. I think there's a lot of hubris here. I think Lehman Russ believes that he can actually beat Horus in hand to hand single combat and so is willing to stake the remaining lives of his legion just to deliver him into single handed combat with Horus, which is I mean essentially what happens in that book. I mean, I think that Lehman Russ would say, had it worked, it would all have been worth it. Like, had he basically exterminated his legion in the attempt to deliver him to the single-handed combat of him versus Horus, it would all be worth it. So it's, it's interesting. You know, in Wolfsbane, that's exactly the point he makes. He tells some of his, uh, the Jarls he's taken with him, like, yeah, I can beat Horus. I've got the Dionysian spear, even though I hate it. Get me to Horus. I'll definitely beat him in single combat. Marines are a resource. Yeah. Did not work out quite as seamlessly as uh, Lehman Russ had hoped, but, you know, that's why we have an interesting narrative. So uh, speaking of those Jarls, let's talk about a couple of them. So the dudes he takes with him, first and foremost, Geiger Fellhand. Uh, Thane of the Volca Fenrica, and known as the Crown Breaker. Done a whole lot of good work on Prospero. Uh, had sworn vengeance against the Thousand Sons. Because, you know, they're still kind of burning hot from that whole suspected treachery thing. And he hasn't had a whole lot to do since then. So this is where Lehman Rouse decided he would be best pointed. He's, uh, Geiger's pretty much at the front of this war host. Uh, he's got scores of space wolves and a Yorlin hunter pack, which is kind of a big deal. These are the kind of the storied veteran packs of the space wolves who are very reminiscent of the Sons of Horus uh, chieftains. So they're veterans who basically all have their own individual honors and sagas in their own right. And they're banded together in these little hunter packs that can do pretty great things together. I like, too, here, it says specifically, 
that while the interior of the vengeful spirit is maze-like and confusing, uh, pretty much by design, that owing to the clandestine reconnaissance of the brothers among the knights errant, Geiger and his raiding force knows the route to their target. They're shooting specifically for the vaults of the Sons of Horus, uh, located along the spine. Apparently it spans an entire three central decks. So, you know, as much as we might make fun of him, uh, Honor Hecarus apparently oversees a pretty damn big museum. So this kind of reminds me of in the the third book in the Horus Heresy series, we get a good description of like the Emperor's children's flagship and just like galleries of art and music and things like that. It kind of reminds me of that. Obviously, they have their own trophies as well. But I think Sons of Horus being what they are and being formerly Chthonian gang members and collecting trophies and having medals and things like that we see it in the depictions of them we see it in the models of them so like this is clearly like integral to the sons of horus and of course horus is going to bring it on his flagship to maintain and instill that sense of chthonian pride so i mean it makes sense to go for this i know where the overarching theme is let's kill horus but also let's hurt him where it hurts you know Right, because while uh, the Black Library books take care of, you know, the major narrative points of like Russ trying to fight his way to Horus, this is specifically like sort of a little side insertion, right? Geiger is tasked specifically with cracking into this vault where the Sons of Horus keep a lot of their war trophies. And, uh, you know, from what they're seeing, it's actually working pretty well. The Space Wolves have, by all accounts, timed this pretty well. The Sons of Horus are trying to fight a war on two fronts. They're fighting against the Trisolian Mechanicum, and at the same time, the Space Wolves are hitting multiple points along the Vengeful Spirit itself. And while you know they are Sons of Horus, they are very competent, you know, close combat, close assault fighters. They're still starting to have trouble redeploying fast enough to take on and repel all of the different ports of egress, or I guess ingress in this case, they're going in, uh, the Space Wolves have made here. So while the Space Wolves are outnumbered, they are losing Legionnaires as they go, they are getting the job done. And Geiger does manage to make it to the central vaults. He's lost almost two thirds of his initial attacking strength. So we're talking a few dozen legionnaires still left but they are here they got to it they caused the disruption their mission was supposed to and this is like a kilometer long library of you know a museum of these relics from campaign banners scourings of different planets wars of compliance pretty much the length and breadth of the history of the 63rd expeditionary fleet just hundreds upon hundreds of like weapons devices pieces of technology from different cultures that this expeditionary fleet has thrown over during the years and of course in true space marine fashion you've got tons of skulls you know from different enemies slain in battles and entertainingly they are gilded in the tradition of the gangs of the chthonian underhive like you mentioned pat so This isn't, for the Space Wolves, this is kind of like a dual-edged sword, right? Like, they are striking at the heart of something the Sons of Horus hold near and dear, but it's also sort of a categorical, organized reminder of how far that the Sons of Horus have sort of fallen at this point. So not only are there, you know, skulls and trophies and weapons from dozens of different cultures they've taken over, but they're also skulls from legionaries, you know, helmets, weapons taken by the Sons of Horus in the Legion on Legion fights. So, I don't know, Dave, what do you think on this, like, uh, sort of dual look at the uh, history of the Sons of Horus that the Space Wolves have found? Yeah, I, I really like it, Jason. I think it's a great link to where we were previously. And I know we're reading these exemplar battles backwards, but if I were to try to connect some themes from Alexandria and Trisolian, I would say it's very much in keeping with the theme that history is being erased. 
right? So the history of the legions before they fell is both being trying to be sequestered and destroyed and is trying to be preserved. And so there's something that is lost that is meaningful to the Sons of Horus, even though they have fallen, even though they are traitors to Terra now. This history matters to them. And I think Lehman Russ knew that. And that's why this side quest of Gygor's fell hands was so pointed. So yeah, I, I really like that kind of thought. That is a good point that I hadn't thought of before. This does kind of bear a, you know, lot of resemblance to the Imperial Fists at Exandria, you know, blowing down the doors of the Temple Pyramid, where the Thousand Sons have kept all of this categorical knowledge. And, you know, it's one of their massive data vaults. Yeah, that is a really close parallel, isn't it? a good point yeah yeah i i think it's interesting and i think it definitely keeps with the theme of well as you go forward anyway i I mean the 40th millennium is a pretty grim dark place and it's mostly grim and dark because so much history and knowledge has been lost and so there is something that's happening here with the destruction of history the destruction of knowledge that's beyond what we would think of as just like a pointed attack at a brother legion. This is more than just a prideful sort of reminder that they're still just another legion, that, that the Sons of Horus can still be wounded, that their, that their pride and their history and their legacy that they hold so dear is can still be taken away. It's sort of more than that at the same time that it is very much just a sort of I'm going to come into your house and break your toys kind of a kind of a moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and obviously this is meant to be a distraction, but at the same time, you can look at it in a whole nother light of the victor writes the history books while we're distracting. Let's wipe the slate clean kind of thing. Also a good point. Yeah. Well, one of the things they talk about here which kind of plays directly into that. So the Space Wolves break in. The Hunter Packs, you know, start setting Crusade banners on fire, kicking over, you know, display cabinets, stealing artifacts, you know, everything you'd expect. And, I mean, like we were saying here, uh, this is kind of a dual function sort of deal. It is a distraction and a strike directly at the honor and pride of the Sons of Horus, the legion that they are. They still have honor left. And they're going to have to respond to it. And in that, it's both eliminating the history of the Sons of Horus, but it's also a distraction that's going to capitalize on that insult and draw them away from more tactically important targets. Because, I mean, overall, tactically speaking, a museum of artifacts isn't all that much of a, you know, it's not like the Engineerium or Sensorium Chamber or the Teleport Crucible, anything like that. There's no tactical significance to it. But because of this pride and honor from really both of the legions, that maybe uh, more pragmatic legions like the Alpha Legion wouldn't have had the same response to. So the Yorlin Hunter Packs are met by sort of their doubles, the chieftains of the Sons of Horus. They are the same sort of storied individual like miniature heroes that the Yorland hunter packs are and they are tasked with first and foremost their chieftain or uh, their captain of the chieftains this is where we get introduced to honor hecarus the captain of the 68th company so this dude is specifically the one tasked with the custodian ship at the vaults he's essentially their museum curator right geiger has the pretty decent idea that as soon as the Sons of Horus start piling in, the Space Wolves have taken up these covered firing positions behind objects and exhibits and display cabinets and stuff in this massive museum waiting in ambush. And not only is it good from the aspect of unreturned flat-footed ambush, but also the Sons of Horus still have that modicum of honor left they don't want to just open fire into all of their artifacts and crusade banners so for the most part while the space wolves were definitely kind of surrounded and outnumbered by this point they take a much bigger toll on the sons of horus who aren't returning fire all that much because they don't want to cause any additional damage to their crusade relics 
So the Space Wolves are drawing the Sons of Horus into these close combat fights where, one, they're exceptional at, but two, it doesn't allow the Sons of Horus to capitalize on their numbers quite as much. Now, once they get more organized, the Sons of Horus, they are chieftains, squad leaders, captains among their own legion. They're pretty serious business. So locking up their boarding shields after that initial ambush, it's not going as well for the Space Wolves as they might have hoped. Sons of Horus, and especially the Chieftain Cotters, are very vicious close combat fighters. They're specialized with chain axes and very close formation fightings with Borden Shields. It's pretty nasty business, and they're definitely taking less casualties now that they've built up enough space and momentum to get these Borden Shields locked and present sort of this combined face to the Space Wolves. And Geiger does have to join the fray himself. He does have those relic lightning claws that he's very famous for. He's doing his best to kind of encircle the uh, phalanx here that the chieftains have built, but it's difficult considering they're outnumbered and their squads of legionaries from the Sons of Horus that are starting to come in and pour in bolter fire trying to support the uh, captain's retinue. And this pause that's caused from the Space Wolf sort of losing momentum is really starting to give the Chieftains enough time to redress their ranks, to pull their formations back together, and really solidify them to something that might have prevented even more so of a catastrophe. So, guys, what do you think of the uh, Space Wolf's strategy here once they've brought the Sons of Horus into full-on close combat? I mean, the problem with close combat with the Sons of Horus and the Space Wolves is this is what they excel at, right? I mean... They're both all about chain axes, all about ripping and tearing, all about total and complete carnage. I do find it interesting, and again, I know we are we're the lore cast, we don't really get into unit profiles. I do find it interesting that the chieftains they're almost made up to be the custodians of an area. Like they come with or they have boarding shields, they don't have a lot of like explosive munitions so it's like they're there to to defend and protect definitely whereas the space wolves the jorlin hunter pack like they come with hand flamers and chainsaws they're very much like we're here to rumble but i mean this scene that jason just read is totally reads into all of that yeah no i mean i like these little epic clashes we get with these exemplar battles because it always shows like almost the true form of each legion that they go over but Dave, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I I think this is a great example of the Sons of Horus being able to kind of dish out as much as they take in. And they're every bit the savage fighters that the Space Wolves are. In fact, you know, I know we don't look at profiles, but if we did, just saying, the Chieftain Squad would come out on top on that sort of just uh, quantitative sort of comparison. But I think they did what they had to. I think the Space Wolves, their tactic of luring the men and getting in close certainly plays to their strengths. Um, You know, it also sort of, I wouldn't be surprised if during the raid, the Space Wolves were uh, pocketing some relics to take back to the Fang. I could see that, you know, as a a sort of a... Antique bolter here. Yeah, we're we're going to stick this in the Fang somewhere so that... 5,000 years, we can tell stories about the time that we raided our brother's flagship and stole this. Well, we might talk about profiles a little bit every once in a while. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's true. It's true. What do you think, Jason? It is kind of interesting, Dave, now that you point it out. Yeah, the Chthonian chieftains are a much more defensive unit, I think, than you might initially expect out of the Sons of Horus. And I think it's kind of interesting, like, Do you think the Space Wolves essentially fought them to a standstill here, even with Geiger on their side and ambushing them? And then uh, it's about this point that they receive word across the entire, like, attack force that the Wolf King had failed to kill the War Master and was mortally injured. I'm curious here, if it wasn't the chieftains that the uh, Hunter Packs met, would the Space Wolves have done, like, better here if Geiger instead met, like, just a pack of, you know, legionaries, you know, hanging out on their rotation to guard the museum? 
you know, if it's just some tactical squads in there instead of the chieftains, like, would this have gone much differently for the Space Wolves? Yeah, maybe. But I think the Space Wolves probably would have got gone and found the, the Kingslayers anyway. They would have gone. They would have sought out the chieftains. Because, I mean, I think for the Space Wolves, there was no plan to get out. Like, this right. was an all or nothing kind of mission. I think they were almost forced to get out by necessity because Russ failed and Russ wasn't just, it wasn't clear to them that he was killed one way or the other. So they were sort of obligated to try to rescue him, which I think had he either succeeded or had he just been like decapitated and been obviously dead um, at the hands of Horus, I don't think any space wolf would be left. I think they would have kind of burned out in a blaze of glory. So yeah, this is definitely the fight they wanted. It seems very similar almost to the battle between the Imperial Fists and the Iron Warriors at Fall. They make pretty good advances into the Iron Warriors fleet and even onto the Iron Blood, Perturabo's flagship. But it's kind of like that last second callback from the Primarch, or I guess in this case, Primarch's retinue as they're hauling his half-dead ass like back to a stormbird that kind of prevents us from seeing like what would have gone down had they finished that engagement to its completion. And I think you're right. If they lose Russ, that's basically the end of them as a legion, right? They're just going to burn out and the Raven Guard would show up a little bit later and there'd be nothing left to save. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, these are the fun counterfactuals that you can kind of like play with and think about. And obviously the Black Library writers are constrained because there's already a narrative and they have to get to a certain point. And so they only have so much sort of leeway to to play around with. And so I think this is sort of one of those like, here's how we thread the needle. We don't really know where Russ and the Space Wolves were at the Siege of Terra. We're not really sure. We just know they weren't there. So why aren't they there? Oh, well, it's because obviously Russ went to try to one-on-one Horus. Well, obviously Russ didn't one-on-one Horus. And so we've got to deliver Horus to the soul system and we've got to deliver him to the final battle, even if he never comes down off the vengeful spirit. So the vengeful spirit's got to be there. So this is one of those, you know, like, how do we thread the needle? And I think it's a really cool way that the writers came up with doing that and giving us some depth and some nuance and playing to the Legion's strength and their character. And yeah, I mean, it's great. I think it's everything that that we want from these little exemplar battles. Yeah. Yeah. What a perfect way to read between the lines, right? Yeah. I mean, you said it best, Dave, but yeah. And who knows, maybe some of the stuff in here, like the Xenocides and things like that, like I said before, will then play into future old narrative. I know it's kind of weird when you think about it, or even future, future narrative, whether we're looking into the scouring or even like the uh, Legion Wars and things like that, just adding into that entire mindscape. So one thing I remember, a little bit of a side tangent, but I think comes into play a lot with the uh, Horus Heresy books, especially because they're essentially like we know the major points of what happens, but one thing that always stuck with me that I think Aaron Dimsky Bowden touched on it a bit, and I'm a big fan of his, but very early on, the author David Gimmel, you know, he's widely considered like, you know, one of the best fantasy authors of all time. There are award for fantasy novels named after him. There's a whole fiction foundation. He's a big deal. One of the things he said that stuck with me in one of his afterwards was after I wrote my first book, I didn't know where to go, and I was thinking about, you know, after he wrote Legend, his very first novel, and he was like, I was thinking about, it was basically one of my characters was old, he was a legend, but passes away, and I was thinking about writing about some of the earlier events in his life, but, like, nobody would want to hear that, right? Like, you know, why would you want to hear that? You know where it ends up, you know what happens, and one of his fans at a book signing says, yeah, but I want to hear how it happens. And he was like, oh, all right, that's a good point. Let me get on that. And I feel like that hangs really close to a lot of the stuff we see in Horus Heresy. We know the big points, but we want to know how they happen, how we get there. All the stuff in between is 
just wide open. And I love seeing some of the fiction like this where the uh, Forge World and Black Library authors fill it in for us. Yeah, that's I think that's beautifully said, Jason. That totally sums up all my feelings about it. So, yeah, 100 percent agree. Yeah. I don't know, guys. I think we've really covered this one pretty well. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think your statement on how Jason sums up these exemplar battles so well. Yeah. I've been a big fan of them so far. They've been a lot of fun to look at. And it's really neat when you can kind of place them exactly where they happen, like in the narrative of the Black books and the uh, Black Library books. Like, we know if you've read Wolfsbane, you know exactly what's going down with like Lehman Russ and Horace. This is one of the things that's happening in tandem with that. And it's cool to see these little events like. Overall, they may not make a whole bunch of difference, but it's very cool to see some of these, you know, tiny dramas played out because the Horus Heresy, I think some of the most fun parts like, yeah, of course, Siege of Terra, hundreds of thousands of legionaries, but these little tiny individual engagements with just a couple dozen on each side are just as fascinating to me as the big giant ones. Definitely. All right, guys. Well, listeners, I hope you've enjoyed this part on, or this piece of exemplar battles. But let's go ahead and get into some plugs. Jason, you got anything to plug? Not a single thing until Coca-Cola offers me a sponsorship. Coca-Cola, you heard it here for probably the 20th time now that I think about it. Please sponsor us. (laughs) We'll show our video. We'll wear uh, Coca-Cola shirts and we'll say Coca-Cola in every third line or something like that. (laughs) Dave, you got anything? Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and give a plug out to our our local game stores, Battlegrounds and Midlothian. If you guys are in Richmond or in any part of like the D.C. National Capital region or you're just here on a weekend, go check them out. Awesome store, tons of gaming space, just an amazing amount of range and great people. I'll also plug Jersey's down in Yorktown. I'll plug Atlantis in Norfolk. And I just spent some time up at the uh, your hobby place in Fredericksburg. So we are spoiled with all kinds of really, really good local gaming areas. And definitely get out and support your local gaming stores, guys, because that's how it all starts. Yeah, definitely. Whether it's a local store or it's a Warhammer store, I know there's not a whole lot of Warhammer stores out there, but also the local one in Richmond, a uh, great place to pick up a box but also check out battlegrounds they have some of the most friendly staff that if young patrick had been in richmond when battlegrounds was around i definitely think things would have been different from a hobby perspective i wouldn't have taken such a large hiatus from warhammer yeah Um, i do forget that we're a little spoiled sometimes Uh, battlegrounds is one of the largest game centers on the east coast and it's half an hour and 45 minutes away tops yeah, we kind of forget that, you know, we're a little spoiled like that some days. Yeah, I'll quickly pug. We've got a Patreon. So uh, thank you to all of our patrons for patroning to us. Your support helps. And thank you, everyone. All of our listeners, regardless, you guys listening to this helps us get out our random thoughts about lore and the heresy. And we love talking about it. And clearly you guys really enjoy hearing about it. So thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, we basically do this all the time with each other. It's just the only difference is we record it and Pat edits it. Yeah, that's about it. So, I mean, this is just kind of like constant brain dump. It's just we put this into a show. So we're so happy you guys like our brain dump. (laughs) But anyways, guys, listeners, thank you so much. And we'll see you later.